I'm Dee Gart. Um, I'm, I'm the chief of the monitoring branch at uh, the NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. We're basically uh, the Asheville branch of NCEI is the world's weather data library. So the weather data that you see on the evening news or that gets collected in a research project will eventually, in its retirement, head to Asheville. Just like a lot of people head to Asheville in their retirement. So um, what we try to do is organize that data and make it available to, to researchers and then really increasingly over the last uh, decade or so to industry, to commerce, to um, the folks that are making uh, business decisions based on environmental information, and in our case, weather and climate information. Um, so I have to start with a confession here. Um, so I'm not the brains behind the hiatus study. Uh, my group is a, we are the monitoring branch. We do the play-by-play -play of the climate system. So we use the data sets that are developed what we call upstream from us by the, the really hardcore data scientists. We're one of their customers. Um, but we do the play-by-play, -play. we write a lot of reports and do a lot of the analysis of the climate system on a month-by-month, season-by-season, and year-by-year basis. Um, so uh, I'm very, uh, uh, very much invested in the, in the data set, in the issues that surround the so-called hiatus, um, but I was not one of the, the lead authors of this article. And the other thing I want to say, I'm originally from Oklahoma. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, ocean conditions and physical oceanography to me is meteorology with the book turned upside down and the density changed. So, um, you know, I, I am, there are dozens of oceanographers uh, in this room that are more qualified to talk about oceanography issues. This is a data science issue and we'll get into kind of what happened. And the short story of the hiatus is um, basically we as a data center do what a lot of data centers do and we look for issues with the data we argue about those issues with our fellow scientists and other data centers around the world and then we make technical corrections to the data sets to uh, make them more appropriate for long-term climate studies um, this is kind of a normal thing for data centers to do you have the raw data over here and you have our best estimate of the most appropriately treated data over here and we take the raw data and, and have others take the raw data and basically try to understand what are the issues with the observing systems over time. Um, so this is a pretty typical thing that goes on in data centers. It's not a particularly sexy thing uh, that, that, that happens. It just so happens that we're doing this in a decade when climate change and climate data in particular is under a tremendous amount of scrutiny. So this kind of became a big deal beyond our comfort zones and really beyond our expertise and beyond our experience um, in the public uh, arena. And so there were some lessons to be learned from that. Um, this is my group at NCEI, um, just some of the people that, that we work on monitoring the climate. So we're uh, a branch. We run drought.gov. We run some of NOAA's climate monitoring stuff. Some of the most wonderful people in the world. Um, and the reason I include them uh, in any presentation I do is because it has been you don't walk into a bar and say, hey, I'm a government climatologist who's buying drinks, right? That just doesn't happen. It hasn't been, <laughs> hasn't been a great decade for government climatologists. So um, basically the grace and the strength and the dignity and the professionalism of these people is inspiring. And I hope my kids grow up to be like any one of these people. They're amazing and uh, they've been great for me and I owe them a tremendous amount and I'm ever thankful that uh, I'm associated with them. Um, so some of, some of the experience comes from the State of the Climate series as well. It's basically the annual physical of the climate system as broadly as we can do it. Um, what is going on? It's the, it's the diagnostic, the annual physical. So the oceanographers work on the global oceans chapter and the atmospheric chemists work on the compositions chapter and the meteorologists will work on the weather extremes chapter. And uh, this experience of how all of these communities treat their data, and this is a data story, so that how all these communities treat their data has been really um, good for the meteorological community because we all have our own issues with data within our professions and to look across the, the aisle of the, the disciplinary islands, oh, that's how oceanographers deal with biases, um, has really helped us get better. So um, the, the, the reason this is up here um, is that climate is, is, is a becoming and is going to become even more so a combined effort from the science end, right? We don't work in a vacuum. We are, we are not, um, we are not going to have a bunch of meteorologists come 
fix the climate issue, right? It's a broad issue. It's going to require participation from around the sciences and beyond. And so this has been a, a learning experience for us. I, I should mention Jessica Blunden from my branch is the lead editor of this for the last six years. I've been drafting along her coattails uh, for the six years, but it's been a, a great experience for us in learning how to integrate the different communities that are working on pieces of the Earth system that uh, are sensitive to climate change, and in some ways indicators of climate change. All right, so uh, for the next 30 or 40 minutes, just the sections, we'll talk about how we compute global temperature. So one of our jobs uh, in my branch is to report each month on the temperature of the planet. So you may hear it's the, the warmest April on record or the third warmest summer in ne Nebraska. And so we kind of compile those statistics and, and try to understand what they mean. Um, then we'll talk about the hiatus itself, the actual con the issue that around which um, our data set kind of awkwardly walked into this issue. Um, then we'll talk about the paper that we wrote that explained why the hiatus, according to our calculations, maybe wasn't really a real thing. And then we'll talk about some of the issues that fell out of that experience. And hopefully those of us that work in uh, kind of the climate business or, or sensitive to the climate business uh, can share a little bit about how, how that goes. Um, so section one. The global temperature, where does it come from? So one of the things that we do kind of boil down to its simplest form is measure the temperature of the planet uh, at the surface. So this is, um, this is a graph of average temperature of the planet's surface um, from 1880 on the left to 2013 on the right because at the time that this data set was coming together and at the time that this hiatus issue, the hiatus was basically a perceived slowdown or stop in the rate of warming uh, of the planet. Um, at the time, this was in 2014 or so, and, and uh, so this is what the global temperature trace looked like at the time. So years below the line were cooler than the 20th century average. Dots that are above the line are, were warmer than the 20th century average. You can see that after several decades of pretty rapid warming in the latter half of the 20th century, there was a little bit of a flattening off uh, of the signal since about the late 1990s. So one could argue that, well, it looks like things flattened out. Maybe, maybe this whole thing has stopped. And that was kind of the, the issue at the time. Um, so I'm, if, if I can ask you to kind of roll your clocks back to 2014, we're going to be speaking as if it were 2014 right now. Um, so where did that come from? They basically come from in situ observations. So uh, in situ meaning in, a, in place. So basically instruments that are at a location that take an observation that is somehow collected or transmitted to some uh, brokering body, uh, usually some international vehicle uh, that, that gets the data into data centers and then the data centers make their calculations. Um, the, the meteorological data comes through the World Meteorological Organization and it has constituent services in each country. Our version is the National Weather Service. Canada's is Environment Canada. So uh, the land data comes through the, the, the weather services of the different uh, nations. And then for our case, there are many kind of international collaborations for data. We use one called uh, COATS, which is uh, uh, meteorological and some ocean data uh, taken uh, by ships and buoys around the world and collected. Um, we don't use satellite information for that particular graphic. Uh, the reason being satellites have some issues with bias of their own that we haven't quite fully figured out. And also because they only go back to the late 70s um, in, in a best case scenario. So the continuity with the early part of the 20th century is somewhat lost if we rely on satellite. We do intend to integrate it in, but there's some issues at the satellite observation community uh, it's wonderful for, for weather. It, it does some wonderful satellite data. It's wonderful for some climate issues. But for connecting what's the temperature this year with a straight face with what was the temperature in 1912, we just aren't there yet with the satellite information. All right, so um, we, you're gonna, I'm going to use the word anomaly. We, we are told by our communications minders not to use the word anomaly. I'm going to slip up and use it. So when I say anomaly, um, that means a departure from normal, a departure from some baseline state. And in our case, it happens to be the 20th century average. The reason the communications minders tell us not to use uh, 
It's because anomaly sounds scary. That sounds like what blows up spaceships and causes things to crash. But um, it's just a term of art in the community for a departure from normal. Um, so we make estimates of the temperature anomaly each month. We combine those into annual values. Um, we're not the only group in the world that does this. NASA has a shop that does this as well. Uh, the Met Office in the United Kingdom has a shop that does a similar function. The Japanese Meteorological Agency also does it. And we all kind of try to compete with each other to see who's doing the best job. And that friendly competition helps us all kind of get better. Um, so um, we come up with, with different analyses of the global temperature. Um, and we do things in different ways. We're kind of poking and prodding at the data science to make sure that we're using best practices and that the slightly different things that we do with the data and the slightly different data sets that we, we use are robust. That's the signal we don't see, or the signal that we see is not some artifact of the way we did it. That it's actually a signal in the data and it holds up basically through several lenses. Does that make sense? All right, good deal. So for the globe, this is a typical map. The global temperature for a year or a month or a season is basically a combination of these grid boxes. Um, we, we, we kind of combined them all together. So this is a map showing uh, that this grid box was this much warmer than its late 20th century average. And when it's averaged with this grid box and this grid box and this one and this one and this one, we get that global temperature anomaly, that difference from the 20th century average. Um, on land, it's a little easier to explain on land than it is to explain the sea surface temperature. So how do we get those grid box values? Um, this green grid box is, that, uh, is representing that Australian grid box. So this is that little green square that landed on northeastern Australia in the last slide. And let's say it has eight weather stations in it that have a long enough record that we can make some sort of meaningful comparison to the 20th century average. And so what we do, are we compute those anomalies. So in this situation, these blue dots represent some normal, some baseline, some expected value for a given month or season for each of those stations. And these orange dots would represent what we may have observed uh, for a particular month or a particular season. And so the difference between what we observe and the normal value is, is what we would call an anomaly. So this temperature minus this temperature results in this anomaly. We would express this as whatever value this is, plus 3.2 degrees Celsius. It was 3.2 degrees warmer than the 20th century average. We take all of those anomalies for the grid box and we simply average them, enough, average them up. We come up with a single anomaly for that grid box and we then combine all those grid boxes, the ones near the equator are bigger because of geometry than the ones at the poles. Um, so we have to weight them by that. But anyway, we come up with the Earth's um, value. That's where we come from, right? So we have uh, this exercise going on on all of those grid boxes, done roughly the same for the oceans it is, as it is for land. Um, and we combine those to get a global temperature. The ocean data that goes into that is shared through a similar international system as the meteorological data. Um, so the, the, the panel that's important here are the, um, this, this is what we typically use. So here are sea surface temperature departures for last month or for the previous month. Um, so they're shaded by how much warmer they were from some baseline. And we take those observations in a very similar way, combine them because the oceans, uh, uh, the observations over the oceans are actually more abundant. We have a higher number of them. We can do smaller grid boxes. So we can be a little more precise with the SSTs than we can <coughs> over, over land. But we do a similar thing. So each one of these dots represents some monthly averaged observation by ships of opportunity, basically boats, shipping vessels passing through the region, and increasingly by buoys. Um, so ships and buoys are where we get the ocean observations. And the hiatus itself is explained by the unique history 
of the way ships and buoys have observed the surface temperatures around the ocean. So um, while this may seem like a data center guy geeking out on the source of the data, it's actually very important to um, what set up this apparent hiatus. Okay, um, that was a repeat. So here we go. So the hiatus, what was it and how did it kind of become a thing? Um, so here we go, we're back uh, in 2014. This is 1880 through 2013 again. Um, 2014 became the warmest year on record, but not by a distinct, mar like it wasn't a statistically significant difference. It was nominally the warmest year on record. Um, at the same time, there was this building public crescendo of, um, gosh, it looks like the temperature has flattened out. So um, there was a, a public wave of uh, folks that questioned climate science and climate data that were increasingly convinced and making a lot of noise that the Earth's temperature seemed to be flattening out and some number of scientists that actually were like, man, it's flattening out, what's going on? So um, despite this 2014 being barely the warmest year on record, um, there was quite a bit of activity, both within the science and out on the streets about what's going on with the, the global temperature. So um, science was looking into this. Um, this basically, this, this event here, so the questions being asked was, did this stretch of years, did that represent some sort of stoppage or slowdown of the global temperature increase that we had seen through much of the late 20th century? So that's the context of where the hiatus came from. Obviously, climate change is a big deal. People are passionate about it. Um, it is, uh, especially outside of the science, hotly debated. It has all kinds of policy ramifications. There are lots of vested interests. You know, the country really wants to, us to get it right. <laughs> and so scientists really want to get it right. And we were working uh, on this data set. Yes, sir? Could you explain the red uh, steps? Oh, um, yeah, thank you. So these are individual years, the red dots. The pink steps are the decadal averages. So this would be the average for the 1980s, the average for the 1990s, and so on. Thank you. Um, all right, I don't know why I subjected you to that twice, but I hope that drove the point home. So, uh, all right, so same data set, but looking at monthly values instead of the year. So these are the individual months that went into the years represented in the previous graphic, but it's the same data, it's the same data. So again, um, this is what we saw since 1880. You can kind of see uh, a lot more noise from month, month to month. The temperature does bounce around a lot more than it does over years. And then you saw the really kind of consistent stair step of the decadal averages. So that's what the monthly uh, piece looks like. And you'll notice a few steps in there, a few pieces in history where there were kind of cooling off periods, uh, followed by warming periods, and then this general <coughs> advance since the mid 20th century or so. Um, if you were to just take a linear regression um, through that, you would see that, uh, which is not the ultimate thing to do, but it's the simplest thing to do. Is the tilt still up? If so, you're still warming, but maybe not at a statistically significant rate. So if you just look at the raw monthly data, we have the temperature going up. It is certainly a lower slope than, say, the temperature since uh, the 1960s or so. So what's going on? What's causing that? Why is that there? Multiple competing theories, even before we got into the really examining the climate system. You know, uh, if you would have asked me at the time, I would have said, oh yeah, well we had this massive El Nino in 1997 and 98. El Ninos tend to release a lot of heat into the atmosphere. And so we saw this warm spike. And then we saw a bunch of La Niñas, the opposite, where the Pacific Ocean is cool. And I would have guessed that. I would have said, yeah, it's just a decade where you had a lot of La Niñas, it'll fix itself. Um, but we had other scientists that said, no, maybe there's something there. And they particularly pointed to the oceans, or their, their hunches were that the oceans were somehow involved uh, in, in this hiatus. 
So the slowdown was more pronounced uh, on some data sets than others, and that's an important tool when we talk about the public discourse. So our data set is certainly not the only data set out there, and it certainly sh it should not be the only data set out there. So the, data, the pause or the hiatus or that slope was a little more or less dramatically reduced in different data sets that are kind of tied to the global temperature. So the UK Met Office, the NASA, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, various satellite measurements of not just the surface temperature, but the lowest, you know, tens of thousands of feet of the atmosphere, they all showed some kind of slowdown and science wanted to know why. And so here were just some of the articles, and um, I, I promise I wasn't just trolling nature, but um, here were some of the articles that kind of popped up in the 2013, 2014, early 2015 time period, and they were focused on, you know, what's the deal with the hiatus? Some of them actually used the word hiatus in, the, uh, in, in their title, and they're basically a bunch of different ways to try to explain why we had this slowdown. If, if carbon dioxide concentrations continue to increase, and that's a greenhouse gas that's driving global warming, why is increasing carbon dioxide met with a relatively flat temperature? That, well, let's explain that, let's figure that out. Um, all right, so that's the background, and I, I don't have the insight into um, all of those papers, but they basically found various culprits, typically de dealing with um, heat distribution into the ocean, ocean circulation patterns, um, basically how the ocean was transporting heat around and quote unquote hiding the extra heat uh, from the uh, greenhouse forcing. So that's where, that's where we are, that's the situation. So a little bit of navel gazing here. Um, data scientists are, are like scientists but not nearly as cool. And scientists are like real people but not nearly as cool. So we're <laughs> Uh, what data scientists do, we, we're like cold case detectives. We're constantly working on old information, trying to figure out if there's something there that we missed the last time around, or the last five times around, or the last 12 times around. That's a lot of what we do left to our own devices. If you were to turn off the public scrutiny of climate information, we would be really happy doing the exact same stuff. What's the deal with the the sea surface temperatures. If you were to ask me, I said, yeah, it's probably some El Nino, La Nina thing. If you were to ask some of the hardcore data scientists in our group, which we did, they would say, you know, there might be something about the data set itself. And if you've ever been involved in quality assurance or quality control of any type, you know that instinct. You know that, ah, let's not believe it totally until we look at the information itself. And so a few, th you know, we had a team, we're, we're not nearly as attractive as these folks, but um, we go back and look at the evidence in the vernacular of the cold case. Um, and this is where data scientists are a little different than kind of classic, you know, physical scientists. Physical science take, take data and try to address questions that they have about the natural world using the data. Data scientists often look beyond the data into the metadata. Where did this come from? Who collected this data? What did we do to it when it got into the doors? You know, that's the kind of stuff that we're interested in. And so we uh, had a team basically routinely looking back at the sea surface temperature data. Um, and one of the neat things about uh, working with big data sets is there's a lot of data that we have that was taken by people that are no longer with us. And one of the real kind of weird joys of working with old data is that you're resurrecting the work of someone that is long since gone, and there's something kind of special about that, and I wish I could go back and talk to some of the people in the late 1800s that were taking observations on farms in Nebraska and say, your work is addressing a major topic of concern in 2016, thank you very much. Um, it's actually a really kind of fun thing to do. Um, anyway, back to our story. So that was kind of self-serving, but we were, so the, ba the punchline of that slide is, a team of data scientists went back and examined metadata, not just in our shop, but some real leaders in the field in the UK Met Office as well. And so, um, so while all this hiatus stuff and all these scientific assessments of the hiatus um, was going on, some teams at data science, uh, data centers were looking at SSTs 
um, generally par part of their routine process. You re-examine data, you rebuild data sets so that you know, physical scientists can use them and be successful. And there's this really nice seminal article by uh, a group led by John Kennedy at the Met Office. Um, and uh, we're going to be using some of their figures to dive into some pretty obscure uh, data issues. Um, we, my institution, read this from one of our friends slash competitors in the field and said, we've got to look at ours. We identified 11 things that we could be doing better with our sea surface temperature data set. Um, nine of those ended up being kind of trivial, but they're the right thing to do in the data world. Two of them ended up having an impact on the resulting global analysis of sea surface temperature. Um, so this is the list. <laughs> we won't get into all of these, um, but the two that made a difference were bias adjustments. Um, and we'll talk about bias in just a second. But we were basically adjusting for the way in which ship observations have been taken over time. And we were adjusting for the ratio of ship observations in the world to buoy observations in the world. Those two things have, neither one of those things has stayed consistent. Ship observations have been done several different ways. We'll talk about them. Buoys are kind of the new kid on the block as far as widespread SST monitoring and the fact that those things have changed over time introduced biases, which is a really scary word uh, in data science. Uh, bias, uh, and we'll talk about random error versus bias right now. Um, so, um, so we often get asked you know, in the business of analyzing climate, how can you tell the temperature of the Earth down to 100th of a degree when the weather stations and the ships and buoys are often only measuring to a whole degree? And the answer is pretty straightforward. We get bailed out by the power of large numbers. Statistically, you throw a lot of observations at something you can get more precise over time as long as the error is random. Um, and we'll have, illustrate that. Um, and then the follow-up question is, well, the instrument's only calibrated to within two degrees. And the answer is the same. You get, as long as the errors are random, you get bailed out by lots of observations. It's the power of large numbers. Sports does this better than anybody. So sports statistics. LeBron James shoots three-pointers. He either makes them or he doesn't. It's a binary thing. It's a one or a zero. But if he does it enough, we can say, oh, he makes them at a 33.2% rate because we have lots of observations. Um, that's a, uh, that's, <laughs> all right. <laughs> you got to build in your uh, friends when you can. Okay, all right, you're welcome, LeBron. Okay. Um, so random error kind of forgives itself when you have enough sample. When you have enough sample, um, however, what if in LeBron's career they moved the three-point line, which they did during Michael Jordan's career, and you can see a noticeable impact on his three-point percentage. That's a bias. That's a change in the way something happens. That's a change in the rules and the change in the setup. Um, what about the fact that we all get older over time? That may be a bias in LeBron's statistics. That may be something that may push the needle in one direction or another. Um, what about other rule changes? Um, so those are kind of sports examples of the things that keep us up at night. And bias is what keeps data scientists up at night. Random error, you just throw more data at it and it fixes itself. And you basically can get more precise and you can reduce uncertainty. You can't eliminate it, but you can reduce uncertainty if you really sample the heck out of the planet. Bias keeps us up at night. It's not, uh, it's not random error that keeps us up at night. Um, the causes of bias in our world are changes in practice, the way we took observations, changes in instrumentations, the actual mechanisms, physical apparatuses that, that took the, the information. And when data scientists want to jump into that, we jump into the metadata the data about the data. All right. So quickly, SST observations are taken by ships and by buoys. They're taken by ships in two different ways we'll talk about. Buoys can either be tethered or moored, or they can be floating around freely. Um, the ratio of these has never been constant. So we'll talk about bucket observations, which have been declining over time, which is this darkest red. And buoy observations, which is that hatched area, has been increasing over time. Well, it turns out that plays a role. 
buckets themselves. So when I talk about bucket observations, it's exactly what it sounds like. Some guy walks out onto the deck of a ship, throws a bucket into the water, retrieves the bucket by a rope, sticks a thermometer in it once it's on the deck, waits three minutes, and takes the temperature. Right? That's how historically shipping has measured sea surface temperatures. Well, you can do that in an insulated wooden or rubber bucket, or you can use a canvas bucket. And if you use a canvas bucket and your ship is tall and it's moving fast, the water on that bucket will evaporate. Evaporation is a cooling process. So canvas buckets read a lot cooler than insulated buckets. That's one bias. And so we won't go into the details, but we went from doing it this way to doing it this way, then going, oh no, <laughs> these are biased cool, going back to doing it this way. That's just with the bucket piece of the ship observations of the ship and buoy composite observations. So part of the effort was going back and examining which boats were using which methods over time. Um, it was never particularly safe or a fun thing to do. It got a lot less safe and a lot less fun in World War II. World War II with U-boats that not only had torpedoes, but they also had guns that would pick people off of the decks of boats. Uh, quickly, ship hands were like, I don't think that's that important to this <laughs> convoy, right? So they, we started measuring uh, through the merchant marine through engine intake. So a port on the ship would take uh, the water in. So that was the second ship method. We basically pull water through a port and pipe it into the engine room through plumbing, literally through plumbing. And then it would use to cool engines or whatever we do with water in the engine rooms. Again, I'm from Oklahoma. I can talk to you <laughs> about cows, but I can't talk to you about engine rooms. So um, bottom line, when you pump seawater through the pipes of a ship, it, it warms the water. Ships generally run warmer than the water, particularly around the engine room. So engine ERI, engine room intake water, reads warmer than the true SST. Bucket observations, because they evaporate before you get the final temperature, because there's evaporation, read cooler than the true SST, particularly for canvas, canvas buckets. And this is actually the main driving issue with what's going on with sea surface temperatures. Um, so we can see a rapid decline in the ratio of deck observations rebounded shortly after the war, but ERI, frankly, it's a lot cheaper. It's just cheaper to take engine room water and measure it than to have someone throw a bucket over the side. It's reliable, it's cheaper, you can make more observations, and so on. We are going to skip that slide out of a sense of decency. So. Um, Buoys are the other new kid on the block um, for measuring sea surface temperatures. So the, the change from wooden buckets to canvas buckets to oops back to wooden buckets represented a bias over time in sea surface temperatures. The other thing is buoys have become the dominant observing system for glo the global ocean. And Drifting buoys have been wonderful. They allow us to reach parts of the ocean that aren't on shipping lanes. We're observing more of the world than we could with traditional shipping routes, so they've been great. They also read about 0.12 degrees Celsius cooler than ship observations, even after we correct for the bucket versus engine room issues. So um, one thing that's going on, um, and that's it here, um, we're not gonna worry about regional differences, seasonal differences, daily differences, those are all issues with climate data, but just on the global and annual time scales, buoys read on average about 0.1 degrees Celsius cooler than ships. And if the ratio of buoys to ships has really changed over a lot of time, if you have a lot more buoy observations that tend to be cooler than ships in recent years, and a lot fewer ship observations that tend to be warmer than buoys, you can kind of see where this is going. What would that look like on a trace of global temperature? It would look like a flattening of the temperature. So a lot of the signal from our point of view, and we are not the last word, there's still science going on about the hiatus, is that much of that flattening is explained by or was explained by the biases inherent in the way we take observations.
I'm glossing over a tremendous amount of detective work, particularly by our British colleagues that did a wonderful uh, job in this. Um, but that's basically what's, what's going on. This is kind of a, one of our last slides. This is the, the bias, the net effect of all the known biases over time. And there's a general trend. There's a bunch of kind of obscure, trivial ones. But generally, the, for the first part of the record, um, the bias was cool, largely because of the bucket method, particularly the canvas flavor of the bucket method tended to make things read cooler than they should be. And we had to correct by this by bringing the past warmer. World War II had a whole bunch of issues, narrow shipping lanes, but particularly this rapid adoption of the engine room intake method. And then we see the emergence of uh, buoys and that tended to um, uh, kind of slow down this dominance of engine room intake and flatten that out with the buoy impact. So the engine room intake effect is kind of the dominant signal. The buoy effect is, a, is another signal as well. The bottom line is um, it made this big of a difference. So this is what the argument about the hiatus boiled down to, is that we used to be depicting the global temperature as this red line, but with those corrections made, we're now hitting that black line. If it looks really small, it is. The hiatus itself was only a really marginal thing to begin with. You had to squint your eyes and wear a special set of glasses to really make it happen. But it became a thing outside science. So science wanted to respond to that. You know, science listens to the world as much as it listens to the data. Um, so that was that. One last slide. Um, this is a, the, the slide I just showed was the old method of correcting the data versus the new method of correcting the data. This is the old method with just the raw data in black, I'm sorry, in green, and the corrected in black. And so the net effect, because of all those canvas buckets back in the past that we kind of warmed up to make them consistent with today's methods, we've actually reduced the rate of warming over time with the global signal. This is something that you don't see a lot on the internet. You see a lot of those darn scientists are pushing the needle, but <laughs> we're pushing the needle the wrong way, if that's what they think, right? We've actually reduced the warming signal of the planet by making these corrections. And I think that's, um, it's consistent with other uh, signals as well. And then just for context, we'll stop here. We're now here. Um, so we're still arguing about this period as a hiatus. We've had another emergence of a big El Nino, which releases a lot of heat to the atmosphere. And so we've kind of left the hiatus behind. The one thing that's in a, that's in a future slide that I won't waste your time by uh, toggling to, there was a lot of work. So in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, and I'm not a prominent climate science, physical science, especially climate modeler type. I'm a data guy. In my opinion, the hiatus that we thought we saw is explained largely by these biases that we continue to go back and revisit and try to correct. Um, but a lot of that climate model work that went into trying to explain the hiatus is really valuable stuff. Um, we know a lot more about some of the subtle interactions within our climate system because all of those ladies and men took the time to go investigate what they thought was a hiatus. And we learned a lot about how clouds interact you know, on the climate scale, how the oceans and the atmosphere interact on the climate scale. Although it seems like it may have been a waste of time, it was not. We are way better equipped. And uh, the, that's kind of the big group hug thing at the end of this talk is the modelers and the data people need each other. We don't like to admit it, but we do. And um, we, they help us see things in our data that we don't. We help them see things in the climate system that their models don't. And it's a, it's a, the system worked, basically. Um, we're a little better off than we were three years ago because it was in the lens of the kind of crucible of climate arguments. It became a big deal. Um, it really wasn't a huge story <laughs> otherwise. It was a bunch of data people, you know, made a, a technical adjustment to a data set 
that eliminated a very shaky hiatus as it was, and, uh, and hilarity ensued. So that, that, uh, that's the gist of my talk, and I thank you for your time, and I think Sunshine's gonna... <laughs>